Hello and welcome back to this course on decent work in supply chains. We started this course by trying to understand the central motivations behind labor law. In doing so, we understood the role that law can play in ensuring decent work. As we had noted in the last video, the practice of collective bargaining also plays an important role. When workers negotiate as a group, there is less unfairness in negotiations with employers. The entities that negotiate on behalf of workers or groups of workers are known as trade unions. As we noted in the last video, the history of the modern trade union also begins with the Industrial Revolution. As we learnt in the last video, the industrialization of production revolutionized the economy, culture and politics. One of the changes that it brought about was that several new types of employers had to now compete among themselves for the labor of workers. This was especially true in cases where the labor required was of a skilled nature. In fact, skilled workers were the first to try to deal collectively with employers. As we learnt in the last video, workers combined to negotiate for better wages and conditions of work. These combinations of workers came to be known through various terms – trade union, combinations and organized labor. Their ultimate weapon was that of strike, that is, to withdraw their labor till the employer accepted their demands. These developments happened in an environment that was not very friendly towards such coordinated action by workers. In fact, agreements or combinations, either of workers or employers, to alter wages or conditions of labor were illegal. Combinations in defiance of these statutes were therefore agreements to commit crimes or criminal conspiracies. In 1799, the Combination Act banned unions and all collective bargaining. All contracts and agreements for obtaining an advance on wages, altering the hours of work or decreasing the quantity of work were declared illegal. Attending any meeting held for any of these purposes was also illegal. On paper, these combination acts could also be used against employers who engaged in some kind of collective action to set wages. But of course, this was never practiced. These laws only served as a weapon against the growing trade union movement. But however, they never really succeeded in breaking the growing working class movement. In 1805, weavers formed a combination to petition the British Parliament to pass a minimum wage law. Workers also began to join organizations that hid their true purpose, such as the Philanthropic Society in Manchester in 1818 that later became the Manchester Trade Union Council. In 1824, a select committee on artisans and machinery recommended that both employers and workers should be free to make agreements as they thought fit and that the restrictions imposed upon this freedom by statute should be removed. These recommendations were implemented by the Combination Laws Repeal Act of 1824, which removed all criminal liabilities for conspiracy, whether under the common law or the statutory law, that is, law made by or under the authority of parliament. The ban was, however, reinstated after a wave of protests. Punishments for trying to form a union were severe and often exemplary. The deportation of the Tolpadal martyrs, a group of agricultural labourers convicted of swearing a secret oath as members of the Friendly Society of Agricultural Labourers in 1834, was a landmark in the history of trade unions. They were pardoned in 1836 after mass protests. In 1830, coal and steel workers went on mass strikes against low wages and unemployment, which was also notable for being the first appearance of the red flag that later came to be associated with workers' revolutions around the world. The Sheffield outrages, a series of attacks carried out by a small group of militant workers in Sheffield, was another important event. This period also saw the establishment of more permanent unions. The United Kingdom Alliance of Organized Trades was established in 1866. This organization was the forerunner to the Trade Union Congress, which is today the largest federation of trade unions in England and Wales. 
Noting the steady growth of trade unions, a royal commission in 1871 decided that there could be advantages for employers and employees in collective bargaining, and a new law was passed. The policy of the Trade Union Act 1871 was twofold. It partially legalized trade unions, and secondly, it instituted a system of voluntary registration, conferring special legal status and powers, and imposing some obligations. In the 1900s, the Labour Party, which was established to meet the need for a new political party that would represent the interests and needs of the urban working class, became the primary political opposition in Britain. Trade unions, which were the primary source of its funding, became very influential in British politics. In 1913, faced with the opposition of the largest trade unions, the Liberal government passed the Trade Disputes Act. This law allowed unions to fund Labour MPs without having to seek the express consent of their members. After the general elections of 1923, the Labour Party formed the government. Strikes were an effective political tool during this period and the practice of forming picket lines, which stopped people who wanted to work during a strike from going into an establishment, became prevalent. Another practice known as closed shops meant that everyone working in a particular establishment and sometimes even an industry were required to be part of a particular union. Now let us learn about the development of trade unions in India. The modern factory system only began in India in the 1850s. And factory workers during this period were former agricultural workers who moved to Bombay or to Calcutta from their villages. Their levels of literacy and experience were only some of the problems that the leaders of the trade union movement faced in trying to organize them. Factory workers united together for the first time to secure better working conditions in factories in 1875. Narayan Meghaji Lokande was a significant figure in the growth of trade unions. He organized the Conference of Workers in Bombay that drew up a memorandum to be submitted to the Second Factory Commission that demanded, among other things, a weekly day of rest, half an hour's recess, compensation for disablement, payment of wages not later than the 15th of the month following the one in which they were earned, and limitation on hours of work from 6.30 in the morning until sunset. The first and second factories commissions, set up in 1881 and in 1884 respectively, produced increasingly better legal standards for work in factories, including limitations on factory working hours. Some of these standards found their way into the Factories Act of 1891. When the Bombay Mill Hands Association was formed in 1890, Lokande was its chairman. This was not really a trade union because it had neither membership nor funds. Many other associations of workers, including those in the railways and in the printing industry, came into being during this period. Lokande also set up a newspaper called Dhinabandhu that focused on the problems of workers. It was not until after the First World War, however, that the trade union movement in India gained momentum. These developments in India should be seen in the context of other working class movements around the world, such as the Russian Revolution and other developments elsewhere in the world that we noted in the last video, such as the establishment of the International Labour Organization. The establishment of the Ahmedabad Textile Labour Association under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi and its declaration of a strike demanding higher wages and a war bonus and the establishment of the Madras Labour Union under the leadership of B.P. Wadia, a leader of the Indian National Congress and a close associate of Dr. Annie Besant in the Home Rule Movement, were significant milestones. These events also indicated the coming together of the trade union movement with the Indian National Movement. For the Indian National Movement, trade unions represented an important weapon with which to tackle the British government. This also meant that several political divisions that were present in India were also present in the trade union movement. This was illustrated sharply in the Buckingham and Carnatic Mill strike of 1920 and 21. As we have seen, the Madras Labour Union was one of the first organized labour unions in India. Workers struck at the mills in protest against low wages and working conditions and their demands were supported by Indian national leaders such as C. Rajagopalachari. The government of Madras responded with force to compel the strike to come to a close. 
The strike then turned into battles between groups of workers divided along caste lines. Binney and company, who were the managing agents of Buckingham Mills, filed a civil suit in the Madras High Court against B.P. Wadia and other leaders of the union claiming damages for interfering with the normal duties assigned to the workers and an injunction order against these leaders. The court granted the injunction pending the disposal of the suit, following the principles of combinations and restraint of trade under English common law. The suit was eventually withdrawn on the basis of a compromise that, among other things, compelled leaders like B.P. Wadia to sever their relations with the Madras Union. The injunction shocked the trade union movement, both in India and in Britain. The British government, which at that time was headed by the Labour Party, felt compelled to take steps to recognize the role of trade unions in the development of the Indian economy. In 1921, the Central Legislative Assembly, the precursor to the lower house of the Parliament of India, adopted a resolution requesting a law for the registration of trade unions and for their protection from civil suits. In 1926, the Indian Trade Union Act was placed on the statute books, providing legal recognition for the role of trade unions. In October 1920, the All India Trade Union Congress, the first federation of Indian trade unions, was established with Lala Lajpat Rai as its first president. Following its independence in 1947, India largely followed a socialist economic approach encouraging public sector employment and pro-worker laws. The trade union movement reflected the main political divisions of the time and was divided mainly along socialist and communist lines. The subsequent decades saw significant expansion in trade union membership with the number of active unions reaching its peak between the mid-1970s and the mid-1980s. While the 1970s in India was a period characterized by political instability, the 1980s was characterized by the beginnings of a distinct turn towards more market-friendly policies and support for industrialists. Two key events during this period were the 1974 railway strike in India and the Great Bombay Textile Strike of 1982. The railway strike was held by the All India Railwaymen's Federation, led by George Fernandes, to demand an eight-hour working day for locomotive staff and a raise in pay scale, which had remained stagnant over many years. It was brutally suppressed by Indira Gandhi's government, which arrested thousands of striking workers and all its leaders. The Great Bombay Textile Strike, called on 18th January 1982 by the mill workers of Bombay under trade union leader Datta Samant, was aimed at obtaining bonus and increased wages. Nearly 250,000 workers of 65 textile mills went on strike. The government rejected Saman's demands and refused to budge despite severe economic losses to the industry. After a prolonged and complicated stalemate, the strike collapsed without having achieved its objectives. The textile industry moved out of Mumbai, leaving thousands of mill workers unemployed. A similar trend of strikes not being able to achieve their objectives could be observed elsewhere in the world, especially in the United Kingdom. The general strike of 1926, during which 1 1.5 million coal workers struck work in solidarity with coal miners who were in dispute with the government, did not have the support of the moderate leadership of the Labour Party. This would repeat more than 40 years later during what came to be known as the Winter of Discontent when in 1978, trade unions disagreed with the Labour Party government and struck work for increased pay. The government of Margaret Thatcher that followed brought in tough laws to curb the influence of trade unions. These laws ended picketing and closed shops and applied strict limits to how much money trade unions could give to the Labour Party. Thatcher's government also defeated the major minor strikes of the mid-1980s, which were attempts to prevent the closures of collieries. The defeat of the strike after it had been ruled illegal is considered one of the defining moments in British industrial relations, significantly contributing to the weakening of the trade union movement. In India, after the liberalization of the economy in the 1990s, efforts at unionization in the private sector were often met with opposition. Statistics from the Labour Bureau of the Central Government's Ministry of Labour reveal that as of 2008, there were 16,154 trade unions with a combined membership of 9.18 million. The trade union movement in India remains largely divided along political lines. Support for mainstream political parties is reflected in the membership of leading trade unions. 
The BJP affiliated Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh is the largest trade union of India. It is followed by Congress Party affiliated Indian National Trade Union Congress with 3.95 million and the All India Trade Union Congress affiliated with the Communist Party of India with 3.44 million members respectively. This brings us to the end of this video on the role of organized labor in securing decent work. We noted how trade unions in India and in Britain were successful during the early part of the 20th century in making demands regarding wages and conditions of work through collective bargaining. We also learnt how trade unions, which were initially prohibited through civil and criminal sanctions from engaging in collective bargaining, slowly attained legitimacy. The recognition of trade unions through law was a milestone both in England and in India. Registered trade unions received immunity from civil liability for anything done in the context of a dispute between employers and employees. We also learnt how the influence of trade unions decreased towards the end of the 20th century. We also noted some of the relationships of trade unions with mainstream political activity, including the Labour Party in England, the National Movement for Independence in India, and affiliations with major political parties in India today. Having learnt about the role of collective bargaining in advocating for decent work, let us now turn our attention to the specific focus of this course, which is decent work for those employed in supply chains today. In the next video, we will learn about some of the specific challenges faced by those employed in supply chains today. Thank you for watching.